Welcome to episode 47 of Successful Demo, each episode will analyze the theory and practical aspects of one newly released cards. Today we'll be looking at Surveyor, which is a Wayland Ice that is actually secretly a HB Ice. And here's why. Surveyor bears striking resemblance to Seder Adaptive Barrier, which was released um, in the previous cycle, if I'm not mistaken. And the thing is, it is kind of a souped up version of Seder, in that it scales twice as fast. Now, of course, Seder has its users. Um, but when you are stacking lots and lots of ice, Surveyor far outpaces Seder in terms of strength gain. Um, so while Seder starts at strength 2 and Surveyor technically starts at strength 0, uh, the double gain means that Surveyor uh, matches Seder's um, strength at 2 pieces of ice on the server and at 3 or more ice becomes outright better than Seder, being of the Sentry subtype, uh, it is harder to break and it has more subroutines to boot. So at 3 plus ice, you are staring down a 5 to res sentry that has 2 subroutines, but space 6 strength and pretty unreasonable trace 6 on both subroutines. So that is an ice that a lot of runners are not really prepared to break, and we are only considering the uh, 3 ice uh, scenario. Uh, oftentimes you can get more ice than that, and Surveyor just becomes nigh impenetrable. Or does it? Unfortunately, Seder, I mean Surveyor, just like most other ice, have numerous available counters in the current card pool. You can obviously bypass the ice, but there are also cards like David, Gubali, Kongamato, Grappling Hook, Maxwell James, that all um, basically render Surveyor's high strength and high traces rather useless. The runner can also simply choose to ignore the Surveyor server. If you are putting lots of ice on the Surveyor server, you simply run the other servers and win off uh, you know, typically you win off centrals anyway. So those are the weaknesses of Surveyor, but in a deck that attempts to stack lots of ice, Surveyor is a very fine complement to Seder Adaptive Barrier. Speaking of Seder Adaptive Barrier, I'm sure you recall one of my previous successful demo episodes where this was used to pretty good effect. We explored it in uh, the Ginger City Grid episode. Uh, where this particular archetype is proven to be very strong if it can get going. You raise a Ginger City Grid, you use a bunch of powerful draw cards such as Ultraviolet Clearance, and then stack all the ice on top of Ginger Grid, including the Cedar Adaptive Barrier, which makes the server super taxing. So this was uh, the general archetype of the deck. Um, it, after pack 2 of the Kitara cycle. Now that we are completely into the Kitara cycle, we realize that the cycle has given us more cards to increase the consistency of finding this particular combo. In place of Ultraviolet Clearance, you can also use a Rashida Jahim, which synergizes incredibly well with Ginger Grid. And then, with Surveyor uh, thrown into the mix of the ice, uh, we now have even more targets for Ginger Grid that make the server nigh impenetrable. Now, um, yeah, you see that there's a weakness here. Even though we have lots of card draw cards and we have lots of taxing ice in our deck, there's still only 3 Ginger City Grids. And as you recall from our Ginger City Grid uh, successful demo, this was the big Achilles heel of the deck. If you don't find an early Ginger Grid, your deck basically falls apart. As it becomes too expensive to operate, you can't afford to spend all the clicks and all the credits installing your Seders and your Surveyors because the runner will just gain a lead on you in tempo. So that is a problem, but again, Kitara Cycle has given us the answer in remote enforcement. This is an alternative to Ginger Grid um, that is another way to get your eyes on the remote without uh, you know, having to pay for it in terms of clicks, which is pretty darn good. It even saves you the rest costs, which while not uh, you know, astronomical like the Chiashis that we tried to use it on in the remote enforcement successful demo is still significant. Saving 4 on Seder Barrier or 5 on Surveyor is a pretty good deal. And as you can see from the cards, this is exactly why I said Surveyor is a HB card in disguise. With so many HB cards that synergize well with this ice stacking strategy, it just makes uh, logical sense to run Surveyor in a HB deck. 
So with all this consistency, you have six copies of cards that can build your remote, six copies of cards to draw you into lots of cards that synergize with uh, Ginger Grid, and five taxing ice. Well, we are playing three Seder Barriers because they're in faction, and two Surveyors because we need the influence, as we'll discuss shortly. It doesn't really matter because we are running lots of other ice as well, so we don't need three Surveyors. It's kind of overkill, and Surveyors are just not that good on Centrals anyway. So what are we spending our influence on? Well, we need money to res the surveyors and Seder barriers. Ginger helps us put them on the remote, but we still need money to res those ice and score our agendas. We are playing Ultraviolet in addition to the strong economy, burst economy cards in Hedge Fund and IPO, which are all transactions. How coincidental. Obviously, this screams that we need to run the douchebag as our remaining influence. Brian Stinson is going to help us out very much if uh, the runner missteps by going below 6 credits. Brian Stinson can give us the huge cash injection needed uh, to basically run away with the game. Kind of like how Ginger Grid snowballs. Your economy will similarly snowball with Brian Stinson as an Ultraviolet, Hedge Fund or IPO all provide you around 10 credits each time you pop it. Not to mention economic warfare to get you in that zone in case the runner plays very aggressively. So that's the deck that we're going to play. It's basically based around these two strategies. The first being the ginger grid combo uh, that where we uh, construct a massive remote server with surveyor. And the other set, set of cards involves pumping up our money with lots of operations. Brian Stinson's to trigger them again and economic warfare to bring Brian Stinson in range. So that's the deck, and we'll see if we can execute our strategy to a T. Today we are up against Mike, whom some of you might remember, was the Euros champion last year. I got him on my channel to talk about uh, his final games, which was pretty cool. And I think this is the first time I've actually played against Mike. I unfortunately uh, haven't had the opportunity to uh, play Meat Space games with him. But yeah, it's an honor to finally get him, uh, get a game with him uh, online and on my channel. Um, so, <laughs> we are up against Max, an unknown factor. This should be interesting. Okay, so. Our opening hand consists of two money cards, including the combo, uh, the ultraviolet into the ginger grid. So there are lots of things we could potentially do here. What I really want to do is to fire off ultraviolet in the face of a ginger grid. So what I'm going to do here is to click one install ginger grid and then take two credits. This way, I will have seven credits and next turn I can rest ginger grid, go down to six and then play ultraviolet to trigger ginger grid. Um, Asa group just makes uh, puts the cherry on top of the cake because it means that I can defend the ginger grid uh, with the enigma without uh, yeah without compromising my ability to play ultraviolet into ginger next turn. A normal HB corporation would not have the extra fourth click needed to install the enigma, but because we are Asa group, we can protect the ginger grid uh, on click one by installing the ginger grid and triggering Asa. Now, we quickly find that we are up against Scumbag Mike as he reviews a DDoS in their bin from the Max Mill. Scumbag indeed. <laughs> uh, yeah, so they immediately face check my server one, which was the ideal play for Mike, my opponent. Um, this was very good play by him, and it's little wonder that he was a Euros champion last year. Had he chose to set up this turn, you know, install a bunch of cards and take money, instead of challenging my remote, um, I would have been able to get uh, the ginger ultraviolet combo off freely and it would be very hard for Mike to recover. However, given the way I played this, um, yeah, uh, uh, given that Gin uh, Mike forced me to res the enigma, it meant that I did not ha have enough money to res ginger and play ultraviolet. So that definitely slows me down a lot as now I'm forced to, um, you know, defend some centrals. I am kind of concerned that apocalypse might be a thing because uh, a DDoS review from Max basically spells apocalyptic doom. So instead of going hard on for the ginger combo, which is usually um, pretty good unless someone destroys your entire remote server with apocalypse, uh, I decided to ice up my HQ and perhaps bluff with a HQ upgrade that might be Christian Grid. That way, um, 
you know, I I won't get caught out by a surprise apocalypse. And yeah, apocalypse just basically wrecks any ginger deck. So here I just uh, take money, uh, credit credit IPO, uh, looking to uh, fire off the ginger grid combo next turn. Right, uh, we are not going to get it done this turn because we only have six credits, not enough to rest ginger and play ultraviolet. Uh, Max, this uh, sorry, Max, not Max. Yeah, Max, Max slash Mike decided to install uh, Black Orchestra and actually challenged my remote, thinking that it was an agenda I was trying to rush. Nope, it's a ginger grid which they couldn't afford to trash, and they're on one credit. So this is my chance to fire Brian Stinson. Uh, so instead of going for the ginger combo, I'm going to fire Brian Stinson. Uh, for IPO and get a whole bunch of credits because I know that this deck can run very poor. You never give up uh, an opportunity to fire Brian Stinson if the runner gives you a chance. Especially with so many daily casts ticking down, this might just be my last possible window to fire Brian Stinson. And I wasn't worried about uh, Mike rerunning my remote to fetch the ginger grid because with Surveyor and Enigma on the remote, I knew it wasn't going to happen. So with that, on my next turn, even though it was delayed by one turn, I finally get to fire my Ultraviolet, get the Ginger combo going, and see a grand total of zero ice to um, install with Ginger Grid. That's not good. The worst thing is, I don't get agendas either, so I can't even rush out for the win. Now, meanwhile, I need to pay attention to what Mike is playing as well. They've installed a bunch of daily cards, and they have Clan Vengeance on the table. Interesting card indeed. They are clearly playing the zero Clan Vengeance combo. Uh, a, a, you know, it's a combo that needs some setup and they have a lot of resources uh, that they want installed which leads me to think that this is not an apocalypse deck after all especially since influence has been spent on cards like Reclaim which they have installed as well so this, yeah, this doesn't look like a, an apocalypse deck it's just a hand-killing deck now, to be fair, uh, Mike has had a very bad draw um, even though they have a lot of money, they don't actually have the zero clan vengeance combo going. As such, I can pretty safely draw into my agendas here, uh, knowing that they can't really trash them using clan vengeance because they have no power counters on clan vengeance at all. Here, I'm going to attempt to score the Vitruvius. Uh, I'm pretty sure Mike can't get into my remote. Uh, I just want to get some agendas out of the way. With my remote as secure as it is, I don't see any need to fire remote enforcement that early on. Instead, I'm just going to attempt to score the Vitruvius. Now, it gets a bit tricky for my opponent here as it, uh, uh, it seems like my uh, Mike has milled all their zeros and all their DDoSs uh, into the bin, which makes it pretty awkward. Right, so they... Uh, decided to use Reclaim to get a DDoS back. So I'm sitting here thinking, why on earth are they so desperate to get a uh, DDoS on the table? Uh, setting up the DDoS and not even using it this turn. You know, typically you would Reclaim for DDoS, fire the DDoS and start running on centrals. But instead, Mike is not running. Mike is continuing the setup phase. So this has me really worried. Are they really not on Apocalypse? You know, you wouldn't leave a DDoS hanging on the table with three clicks to spare unless you are on Apocalypse or something else that requires you to run all three centrals. So that has got me really worried. I would score the Vitruvius here, but I'm kind of concerned that an Apocalypse would end my day. So after thinking for a while, I decided to show up R&D with Ginger into pop-up window. The pop-up's not going to do anything. What I really wanted to do was to activate my inner ice so that it would actually do something against DDoS. Here I was hoping to draw into more ice to stack on R&D with Ginger Grid because I kind of felt that something amiss uh, was going on. Uh, unfortunately, I click 1 draw, click 2 draw, all I found were hedge funds that you see in my hand. Had they been ice, I would have put them on R&D, uh, thereby allowing me to be safe from any impending apocalypse. Yeah, I'm really playing around that Apocalypse card. It seems super unlikely given his deck, but if you've seen his Euros decks, you know that he's pretty... He loves his one-off Apocalypse. And, you know, I have that sneaking suspicion that it might be coming, but I'm not too sure. Again, I'm trying to look for my eyes here, but not drawing my eyes, I decide, well, you know what? If an Apocalypse is coming, I want to score an over-advanced Vitruvia so I can retrieve cards from my bin. He plays Amped Up, Gaining clicks, what the shite is this? Amped up, trashes apocalypse due to brain damage. Okay, um, oh, okay, and oh dear. 
Um, I was trembling in my seat here. Um, I guess I got lucky in that this wasn't a real life game because, yeah, that confirmed my worst fear. If there is one kind of deck that ginger decks fall hard to its apocalypse. In ginger decks, as you can see here, we tend to focus on putting lots of ice on the remote. This means that our centrals are very lightly defended. We typically only leave one very taxing piece of ice on each HQ and R&D. In this case, Fairchild 3 on R&D. I forgot why I put on HQ, but well, it was not relevant. DDoS means that I can't res it. So my centrals are basically undefended, but thankfully, Mike decides to go for the remote instead of firing off the Apocalypse. Because their Apocalypse was trashed by the Amped Up, they had to choose between recurring Apocalypse with their final same old thing, or recurring Levy with their final same old thing, because both Levies and Apocalypse were in the bin. They had to choose one or the other, and Mike decided to go for the Levy, thinking that they could contest my remote with Stimhack. Well, they're kind of right. Uh, with 41 credits, there's no way I'm keeping them out, not even with a stacked server containing surveyors and Seder barriers. I'm still going to try anyway, since they've launched a steam hack into my server. So I'm going to res both Seder and Surveyor. They pay 4 plus 5 to break the Seder. That's all their steam hack money. And now they bump into the Surveyor. That's going to cost them a grand total of 14 credits to break with MK Ultra. You heard that right. And each strength Surveyor costs 14 credits to break. That is utterly ridiculous. So yeah, uh, this is not the kind of ice you want to face check. But my opponent does have the money for it. Now, uh, Mike makes a very interesting call here. Instead of breaking the Surveyor with MK Ultra, they decided to let Tracers fire. They're willing to take the two tags, um, but uh, they want to get a discount on the Enderun subroutine. So instead of paying 12 credits to break the Enderun subroutine, they are going to pay 8 credits to break the Trace. So this is the good thing about Surveyor. Even though it's a trace-based ice and tracers, tracers as a subtype tend to be weak because of their weak base tracers, Surveyor by no means has a weak base trace. If you're stacking 4 ice on the remote, Surveyor has trace 8 on the end of the run, which basically means that it's not worth it to beat the trace. Well, whether you're trying to break the ice with a sentry breaker or beat the trace, you are losing as the runner. So they beat my Surveyor, they break my Enigma, and I'm going to rest the Ash here, which is pretty meaningless. I'm poorer than the runner, so there's no point in me boosting the strength. Mike safely is able to beat the Ash Trace, clear out my remote, and score the double advance Vitruvius. This puts them on only one card in hand, so they really want to use the Levy by the end of this turn. Or they could go for the same old Apocalypse. Um, both are still possible. I'm still trembling in my seat because if they run Archives, run R&D, and then go for the Apocalypse, they would have won the game. Well, almost. <laughs> well, they would have destroyed basically my entire board. But instead, they go for the Levy and clear the tags, firing the Clan Vengeance before going for the Levy. So this puts another agenda in the bin. Clan Vengeance hit one of my other Vitruvii. And, well... My opponent ended their turn on 3 credits, so we are going Ultraviolet. Ultraviolet draws me into 2 Architects, which I immediately put on R&D, so that there is no chance of my opponent ever firing an Apocalypse off again. And with the Ultraviolet install, I install Double Advance on Install Single Advance? Whatever, I install Advance the remote enforcement because it's time to score agendas when my opponent is poor. So you see how quickly the game turns. Um, my opponent made a big combo turn but ended the turn on too few credits. Brian Stinson put me back into the game by allowing, allowing me to refire Ultraviolet, uh, score the remote enforcement and put a Seder barrier on the remote again. This remote is starting to look real disgusting if you ask me. Two Seder Barriers and a Surveyor, both of Strength 7 and 10 respectively. Mike is never getting back into Server 1 ever again. So my play from now on is pretty obvious. There are only two places which agendas can be in, R&D and Server 1. As long as I keep my hand clear of agendas, I'm going to win the game because as soon as I top deck any agenda, it goes straight into the remote for scoring. And I have more than enough money to protect both R&D and my remote. So yeah, the game just shifted 180 degrees right there. Um, as I clear my hand off my last agenda, it's starting to look somewhat grim for my opponent. 
Uh, one of their main win conditions is Clan Vengeance, uh, which is now powered by their now installed Zero, but there's nothing worth using Clan Vengeance on in my hand. This Asa deck is not a combo deck. It doesn't rely on operations like Biotic Labor or Punitive Counter Strike to launch an assault against the opponent. All it does is install lots of ice, install agendas, score agendas. And that's where we are going to go again. I've ran out of Surveyors and Sado Barriers in my deck, so instead I'm installing a random piece of ice, resing it for free, but most importantly, powering up my Surveyor to 12 strength, powering up the Sado Barriers to 8 strength, and well, <laughs> in a stunning twist of events, uh, you, as some of you may be familiar with, um, in Max's art, uh, she is showing uh, the punk symbol, uh, the rock symbol, or whatever it's called. Well, I'm now building two towers of ice that resembles that symbol. Uh, the pointer finger and the ring finger going, Oh yeah, <laughs> this is... These are my servers, you're not getting into them. As I top deck my Vitruvius, well, I'm just gonna score it. Better score a two-pointer that doesn't win me the game, than to have my opponent steal it with Mad Dash. So, uh, Vitruvius goes in the server, I advance it. Um, I'm planning to over-advance it and score it with one advancement counter so that I can recur something from the bin if need be. The other reason to do this is if I top deck an agenda of R&D on my next turn, I can instead double advance the Vitruvius, uh, score it without extra advancements, and then jam the newly drawn agenda into the remote. As I said, all, uh, the, my main concern at this point is to make sure that I end my turn with no agendas in hand, no agendas in bin. As long as they're stuck in R&D and server 1, I'm good to go. So uh, Mike attempts to a futile uh, clan vengeance fire into mad dash on archives and didn't get it, unsurprisingly, because as I said, I'm keeping my HQ completely clean. But, well, they are finding their alternate win condition in running my R&D with a stim hack. This is a very good play from Mike because uh, there's one secret that I don't want you to know about my deck. I'm running real three pointers. This is kind of guessable given that you probably have seen a Fairchild 3 at some point, meaning that I'm not running global food, I'm actually running SSL. Two copies of it, still in R&D. 15 cards left in R&D, 2 in 15 chance for Mike to fetch the SSL. It's not gonna happen, they're too poor. Even though I give it, I've, gave them, gave, I've given Mike several turns to recover, this R&D is ridiculously taxing thanks to Ginger stacking so many ice. I mean, the best part is, I didn't even need Seder Barrier or Surveyor on R&D to make it taxing. Uh, Fairchild 3's architects all do their job. And this is why HB makes perfect sense as the faction to play uh, this combo in. Uh, you want to have ice that can stand on their own, that tax sufficiently well on their own. Because uh, usually, this, is, this is an anomaly, you don't usually draw two ginger grids um, early on in the game. So typically R&D and HQ will be lightly defended as you can see from my current HQ. You, there's just one piece of ice on it. So you want to make that one piece of ice count and Architect and Fairchild 3 are pretty good uh, in that regard. As I mentioned, uh, since I didn't top deck an agenda, I'm just going to score the Vitruvius with one advancement counter and attempt to win the game uh, by drawing into a final agenda. Now, on the surface, it looks like I've completely locked out my opponent and that the win is basically mine, in my hands. Unfortunately, that is far from the case. Again, the fact that there are two SSLs in R&D out of 13 cards is a huge problem. Um, as much as my opponent might not be aware of that fact, all it takes is a good stim hack run on R&D for them to win the game. Um, all they need is 14 plus credits to break the two architects, the Fairchild 3, and any other ice I decide to rest on R&D, which wouldn't be a lot considering that I'm only on 4 credits right now. Um, so the 14 plus credits can easily be covered with their current credit pool and the same old stim hack which they have access to. Um, and I have very little recourse for the next turn. Being only on 4 credits, uh, what could I do? Even with a Vitruvius counter, I could click for credit, take a hedge fund. That doesn't do that much because I don't have a surveyor on R&D either. My R&D ice isn't going to do as much as I would like. Ash is also not very useful. I could recur Ash with Vitruvius, but that would leave me with no money to pump into the Ash Trace, rendering it rather useless anyway. All in all, I have no way to defend against an, a top deck SSL win on R&D, and this is what's really concerning me. 
um, again, I think a lot of, uh, say, casual players would not think too much about this situation. They would just, you know, take money and then uh, try to score their next agenda. And if they lose to a top deck SSL, they'll just say, well, I got unlucky. But for me, I know that there are so many possible lines of play. I just, I want to find the best one that would minimize the chance of that unlucky situation happening. After a lot of analysis paralysis, I decided to make a questionable risky play. I was going to click one draw and hope to draw one of the remaining 4-2 agendas in my deck. Same odds as SSL, 2 in 13. If I click one draw into said card, I would be able to click 2 install and click 3 advance and threaten the win next turn, being fairly confident that they won't be able to get into server 1 or, um, you know, uh, yeah, and you know, if they don't run R&D, I would win. So that ex exactly that happened. I lucked out on the draw that was uh, less uh, like, yeah, that was less than a 1 in 6 chance and I got it. I'm not sure what I would have done if I had drawn some other card. I probably would have taken the credit and used Vitruvius counter for hedge fund, but it's really, really hard to tell. Um, this uh, exact line of play perfectly paid off and that was huge because um, I had exactly exactly three credits remaining in my bank, which allows me to threaten the win next turn uh, with the squad sales team. I really don't know if this was the right line of play. Obviously, in hindsight, since the top card was the 4-2 agenda, this, this ended up working out very well. Um, Mike wasn't able to muster up enough money to run R&D. Instead, they played Levy, so that was a win for me. But was there any other line of play that would have been better in terms of uh, assuming that the top card of R&D was unknown? I'm not very sure. I don't think the click one draw was correct. There probably was a better line of play somewhere. Let me know in the comments what line of play you would have taken in this situation. Before working on this successful demo episode of Surveyor, uh, I've heard numerous people complain about how nasty Surveyor is and how oppressive it is to play against. After giving it a whirl myself, I realized that as strong as Surveyor is, you know, um, it is prohibitively expensive to break with MK Ultra or Trace Through after all. But it definitely has counterplay to it. Mike had a couple of opportunities where he could have easily neutralized um, uh, the threat of Surveyor. Uh, of course, uh, towards the end of the game, he was Hail Marrying on R&D. And had he had a bit more money, he could have easily top decked the winning SSL. So there's always a shot against uh, a Surveyor deck. And most importantly, taking you back to the amped up turn where the apocalypse hit the bin. Had uh, Mike went for three runs on centrals followed by same old apocalypse, I believe, I strongly believe he would have won the game. Because I had no ice in my hand, as you can see from the board state here. I had six agenda points worth of agendas that would be in the bin. Uh, so Mike would basically be at match point. I have no way to win. I have no way to defend my centrals. Uh, I would have lost very, very quickly. So yeah, this was all. This was really a Mike's game. Uh, he had me because Apocalypse is such good tech against Ginger City Grid decks. Um, just went for the Apocalypse instead, uh, the Levy instead of the Apocalypse, which basically cost him the game. But yeah, to the point, a lot of decks, I mean, even if you're not packing Apocalypse, there are, as I mentioned in, at the start, there are lots of ways in which Surveyor can be dealt with or circumvented. If you get to the point where you feel entirely helpless against a Surveyor deck, Something probably went wrong somewhere, chances are, and it's good to look back on, at videos such as this to see where things may or may not have gone wrong. Right, let's round off this video with our usual combos. What combos very well with Surveyor? The things that we didn't get to show off in our deck are boom. Now, uh, most people ignore that the Surveyor actually has a first sub routine that gives the runner two tags, and actually, a lot of runners, while making Hail Mary runs or trying to steal an agenda in the remote, will often just break the second subroutine or trace through the second subroutine while ignoring the first. For example, if you have a David, you might just use only one counter, saving the other two David counters for perhaps a surveyor further down the road or some other big ice. Uh, and this can be aptly punished if you are in the Wayland faction and have a boom in deck. So if I'm playing surveyor in Wayland, I would definitely be running at least one copy of boom to punish greedy runners.
Mm, Team Wekundu is also a great home for Surveyor. Uh, specifically, if you are playing a vertical Jinteki Glaciers slash Rush strategy, you are able to use your ID ability to build Surveyor strength. This negates the need to spend influence on Ginger Grid, um, which is actually quite a big deal. Uh, this way, you can afford more influence for other fun stuff. Uh, Ginger Grid being 6 influence for 3 copies is a bit expensive and especially considering that 3 copies of Surveyor also cost 6 influence. So uh, if you are going to play Surveyor in Genteki, I think M Team Kundu is the best home for it. Now in, G in HB, uh, you can also instead of playing Arsa Group, you can instead go for Nick's design. There are several good reasons for doing this. Firstly, you can set up Surveyor from turn 1. It doesn't even have to be on the remote, a Surveyor on a central. Um, is a good start and in subsequent turns you can put another ice on your centrals and Surveyor goes up to a rather respect respectable strength 4. Next design, more importantly, also allows you to def defend the entire combo that gives Surveyor its legs, the Ginger Rashida combo. Um, most decks will have trouble defending early Gingers and Rashidas. Um, if you remember this game, um, uh, Mike in the early turn installed a black orchestra against my Enigma and tried to contest my Ginger Grid uh, but they failed because they uh, reached the server with only one credit to spare. Had Mike had five credits when making that run instead of one credit it, or if Mike decided to do a stim hack run instead uh, I wouldn't have the Ginger Grid, I wouldn't have been able to construct the entire surveyor server and my game plan would have fallen entirely flat on its face. Again, another way in which um, counterplay is possible. So yeah, uh, next design circumvents that because it allows you to set up the Ginger or Rashida combo that much earlier on, on in the game when the runner doesn't have their Black Orchestra out yet and that's a big deal. Of course, as we all know, next design is a, you know, a, a maximum jank. Uh, it's a terrible um, identity and you really shouldn't use it unless you are a bad player. So with that said, thanks for watching and good game. Well played to Mike. Happy net running and I'll see you in the next episode. Goodbye. No, Timmy, no. What are you thinking? You crazy guy. Oh, this is why I love Timmy Deck so much. He's a, such a genius.